Hi Steve. Hello. Do you want to um, kind of just introduce yourself and just give us a bit of uh, information? I'm Steve about... Cobby, 48 year old, uh, year old, 48 year old, Kingston native, uh, born and bred in Hull. Um, never lived anywhere else, travelled extensively obviously, which just made me love the place even more. Um, solo artist now, but previously in yeah, about half a dozen different collaborations the most prominent of which would be Freela Brasilia. And um, what kind of, if you were to recommend anything from sort of like your past um, collaborations, obviously Freela Brasilia being one of them, what kind of tracks or albums like would you recommend? Because I know it's your own stuff, but I think when you're coming across a new artist, it's always like, where do you start, kind of? Well, if someone was get, if someone well, was getting into Feel of Brasilia today, what kind of what well then kind of that it, that'd do? be kind of dependent on the, it's it's like taste it's such a kind of mercurial thing yeah. that if somebody came to me and said right you know if I was a greengrocer they said right you know what what should I pick from your stall and you're going mm -hmm. like well you know do you yeah. like avocados or oranges yeah you know and it's so the same with music you know I mean? own, well, I think, and that's the beauty of the internet isn't it is that you, you don't even, you don't have to buy anything you can suck it and you can suck and see all of it you know you can, yeah yeah you can have a listen before and so i suppose if you're kind of into um you know if you were into certain styles of music then you'd you'd gravitate towards different uh parts of the back catalog yeah different uh ways, you know yeah. there's it's up tempo down tempo uh, I mean, obviously, it's a pretty big archive now as well. So there's no, there, there ain't one defining tune that I'd point anybody towards and go, "That's indicative of of my work." Mm -hmm. uh, I'd say, you know, if if and and you know, different days you can be in different moods as well. You might want to listen to something a bit jollier mm -hmm. one day, something a bit more melancholy the next. So um, I'd say, you know, you just start ploughing through it. <laughs> so just on, relentlessly. Just on the theme of like fruit and stuff, because I remember when I met you before. We're talking about banana bread. Well, I love Are you cooking, cooking at the minute? I am, yeah. What am. are you making I, today? I'm, I, today, it's most probably going to be the sacred ragu. <laughs> sacred ragu? <laughs> the sacred ragu, yeah. I've actually finally, met, after years of trying, I can make a decent bolognese now. Nice. Uh, and, it, yeah, it doesn't involve tin tomatoes. I'll, I'll, no I'll, tin tomatoes? No, whatsoever, no. It's about, you just kind of brown your meat off. Well, get your, your uh, meal point, as they call it, your celery and your onions and your carrots. Get them kind of simmered down for 20 minutes and then you just chuck like a kilogram of meat in, half pork, half beef, mince, and then just render that. It's mad. You just leave it rendering for like an hour and it just it just kind of starts caramelising and then a full tube of tomato puree, another 45 minutes rendering, and then like, you know, a, a cup full of wine and a cup full of milk, another hour simmer. Boom. So you're, you're saying rendering, it makes, me, it makes me think that you're speaking about food as if it's music. Like, well, render it, no, not, yeah. not, not like saying rendering. No, rendering, <laughs> just rendering the fats down, you know, so that it breaks it down yeah, and it, yeah. it just makes it a lot softer then, you know, instead of it being kind of, you know, tough. The longer, obviously, you kind of sim something, the better. But I'd never done it without any stock, you know, I'd mm -hmm. never done it without stock. It's like you put the stock in last almost. So that's the sacred ragu. Do you right see? There. Do you see many kind of like similarities though when you're creating, like whether it's food or music or? There's loads. You, you know, I mean, I think that you know, it's all out, a studio right? is a kitchen. You know, and you've got all these different ingredients, and you're trying to put them together in a way that maybe nobody's thought of doing before. Not that mm -hmm. it's like massively original. It's not like you can you can't kind of invent new ingredients. You might find ones that people are shy away from. But I've always been into the idea of of, of it being a melting pot. Yeah. So it's not, I'm not going to keep knocking omelettes out, regardless, you know, uh, uh, because people like omelettes. It's like, <laughs> here's another on fucking omelettes, over and over and over again. So you try and kind of keep it interesting for yourself as much as, as the people that are, are listening to your work as well, that you, 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 you're you open to as many influences as possible so that that kind of nourishes your work it, it, and you're not just closed off and, and, and going, right, this is my genre, this is my oeuvre as the French would say, <laughs> um, and, and then and to not steer any kind of other paths or courses outside of that. You know, I've always been tried to be as open-minded as possible in, in, in my writing and my listening. You know, I think the more you listen to, the better your writing is. If yeah. I just if I just listen to nothing but, I don't know, hip-hop, like 24-7, then yeah. there's no way that I'd be writing the music. I mean, I might be able to, like, knock out some righteous hip-hop, <laughs> but that's that's not enough for me. Do you know what I mean? I wanted yeah. to be able to do something that that reflected my kind of broad tastes. 
you and know. where do you think your broad taste come from then? Do you think it's from your upbringing and like, yeah, past most things, probably, but... yeah, a bit of that. Uh, and then you know the people you move amongst when you're at a kind of impressionable age. And I was yeah. fortunate enough when I left school to to kind of meet some really kind of switched on people. Um, up to kind of between like sixteen and twenty, I had some fantastic uh, record collections kind of hove into view uh, through third parties that uh, you know being brought up in all. I mean, so like when I met Porky, uh, he's he's from Wolverhampton, and his record collection was like a, a breath of fresh air because there weren't any. I mean, you know, reggae in all, there weren't any. You know, I, I had like Bob <laughs> yeah. Marley and Althea and Donna. That was it when I was growing up, you know. And yeah. I knew I knew I liked it, but there was nowhere that I could have gone to listen to it. There was nowhere in all selling it, you know. No, obviously, yeah. pre-internet, you, you know, you just. You were stuck, you know. You were just waiting for somebody to kind of recommend something to you, but you. you and you how did you do to me as well? Well, he was he was just sharing house with the girl I was going out with. Mm. He'd, he'd come back to all because he'd had a year out where he'd kind of done two years study and then given up, and then he came back, uh, and 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 moved into a shared house that I was that I was seeing the last called Debbie Burns, the Scottish nurse, um, and and it was it was a communal vibe, you know. There was four bed sits and he was he was renting one of them and so you know we went down the boozer together we were just kind of our venn diagrams began overlapping <laughs> and then obviously we you know we're into music could you know could tell he was into his music as well and, and i started rifling his record collection so i mean but that's that's you know a small it, it was a predominant one but that's one of the examples of me just kind of coming into contact with somebody who who had you know impeccable taste my uncle john was another uh, he, he his record collection was phenomenal. Still is, you know. It was like Prince Farai and Cabaret Voltaire and kind of, you know, he had he had what you'd call a John Peel collection. You know, before I was kind of yeah. aware of who Peel he was, he had this kind of, you know, outsider collection. It wasn't anything to do with the mainstream, you know. And that again was like a, it was a massive influence on me because I was intrigued by these things that didn't kind of conform to. The, the pop or mainstream, yeah. I found them a lot more uh, attractive than the things that were kind of getting pumped out, uh, you know, in, in mainstream media. But, like, you know, well, it was only Radio 1, really. I mean, that was it. Everybody listened to Radio 1 when I was a kid, you know. I mean, forget local radio. It was Umbersad, you know. You couldn't get more parochial. You know, they were still playing kind of Mrs Mills and Russ Conway. Um, and, and so... You know, you were you. I used to listen to the radio. I'd kind of sit there like long wave or short wave and just go down the dial, and you'd list you things would kind of prick your ears up. Um, and so it was a, a forever looking for otherness, I suppose. I don't know where that comes from. I don't know what that kind of quite. I mean, that's my dad had a good record collection, but he wasn't kind of like right. Where's the margins? You know, let's go and look out there. Yeah, because uh, I remember you were saying about that earlier. So, like, was there anything in particular that like piqued your interest in your dad's collection? Is that all you? Can well, he had this. There was a couple of things. Mike, Mike Oldfield, Tubular Bells. That was a massive influence on me. I, I thought that was like, wow, twenty minutes each side. I got lost in that as a kid. Uh, I think that came up when I was about eight and nine. But he he did that. He was a lorry, uh, no, a coach driver, and somebody had given him a cassette of it. And so he was driving through Switzerland, and he used to put it on because he said it went with the drive. It was like you know, yeah. perfect for the kind of. Uh, landscape that he was going through, and um, and so he kind of came across it by accident, and 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 he went out and bought it from Sid Scarbers and brought it home, and and it was like it, it'd never be off the turntable. And Motown Chartbusters Volume Three, that was that was uh, wore that out. Be, uh, just uh, the best one actually. I think they ended up doing about twenty compilations, didn't they, Chartbusters? But that one, Volume Three, is just like just a shining pinnacle of genius yeah. um, but, well, but that could be my emotional attachment to it as well but there was another one that he got it was his Sunday Rock uh, Sunday Times Rock compilation which was a triple album and uh, I'd forgotten I mean I, I almost got to the point that I thought because he'd long since sold his records I thought that it wasn't even pressed up it was like oh, I imagined it and then and then somebody had archived it and, uh, and, and made a blog about it online about five years ago and I was like yeah man, that was and it was almost like the Sunday Times couldn't afford to do a proper history of rock. So it was almost like just, the, it was like Frank Zappa and Captain Beefheart. And it was like, it was all the kind yeah. of outsiders. And, and Tim Buckley. And, and it, I mean, it's an astonishing collection when you kind of step back and look at it. But that was, that was massive 
massive influence on me. I, I, I can't I can't underestimate that that the influence that that album had on me. So them three had most of my sound. My dad's record collection are the ones that I kind of was vividly attached to. And then uh, you know my Elvis records mm. that I'm, I went to see uh, mm. Boulders in Gypsyville. And you were saying as well, like when it, when you were listening to that um, the Tubular Bells record, you said it went with the landscape that you you know, yeah, yeah. driving in and stuff. I was watching a documentary recently and it was all about how um, an artist got influenced by the landscapes that he was driving through. Yeah. And are you well, kind of quite... Well, escapism in... music. Yeah. Are you, you know, I don't think it's... There's a big part of it is it's like kind of... It's it, it's a legal drug. Certainly when I was a kid, you know, it was like it just you just get swept off into kind of other worlds. You know, and it was, it was like a narcotic... And I think that it has that value, it has that power. I, the, the, in fact, last night somebody had shared a clip about, and I, and I, and I reposted it, about this um, this old guy uh, in an American um, care home, and he's, he's kind of not there, you know, he's not really answering any of his questions, pretty much shut off in his own little kind of bubble. And then they stick the, the, his headphones on and, he, and his iPod, and, and it's like all the 30s tunes that he used to love when he was a kid, and the guy just kind of comes to life. Yeah. And you think that's the power of music, you know? It, all of a sudden, he's kind of like answering all the questions. He's kind of like there's a sparkle in his eye, you know. And 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 people, I think, because it's been over commercialized and kind of uh, watered down because of that, it, it it's almost like blasphemy to me that what what what's happened to music in yeah. some respects is because it is this incredible healing, powerful tool. You know, it's universal love right there in sonic form. Uh, but you know, people have took it and kind of used it and abused it and turned it into kind of you know a thin pissy stew, you know, when it could be caviar, you know, and and uh, back, well, back to food again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Gone full I don't mean to. Now. Yeah. But you know, it, and so it's 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 an incredibly kind of powerful thing, and um, and it's and it's underestimated, you know. I think because it has been over commercialised, people forget just how powerful it is. Certainly for me as a kid, it was it was. Uh, it was like this force of nature, you know, that just kind of swept through my life and, and, and ultimately kind of picked me up and propelled me forward. Do you think kind of like art or artists is like a, an influence on you as well? Because I know you, was, you were saying that it's an artist that's done your, um, your cover. Doug, yeah. Well, I, I, not doubt, no, I mean, I think cre all creativity is good. Right. Yeah. I think you know I don't I don't go right that's the bigger influence than that you know I think any any creativity is good I think that's the human innate human condition is to make things and we're not allowed to really you know capitalism said no don't make things yeah. just just fuck if you do make something make it for somebody else and do it over and over again you know and you're going <laughs> like well right, is that what we're about because you see kids and they love making shit you know what I mean it's it's, yeah. it's it's beautiful it's a beautiful kind of process. Everybody gets a buzz out of making something, whether it's like a set of shelves or, you know, an omelette, doing it properly, you know. But if you get into making things, it's its own reward. You know, I mean, it's even better when you can kind of make a living out of it, obviously, but it shouldn't be about that. I think creativity in itself is its own reward and not enough people get the opportunity to do it. Because certainly in, like, Northern... If you're Northern European, you know, it's frowned on. I mean... <coughs> The number of times people tell me to get a proper job when I told them I was a musician, I've lost count. Yeah. They don't see it as a proper job. Whereas you go, the further, like, you know, you go to, like, Latin cultures, not only is it a proper job, they know it's essential. You know, it's a reason yeah. for living. You know, they, they absolutely worship it, you know. Whereas we've kind of, like, turned it into something that's almost stigmatised. It's like, oh, you don't make things, do you? You go, yeah, I fucking do, actually. And yeah. I reward other people. By doing it, you know, I share it and it nourishes their lives. What the fuck is wrong with that? You know, but it's still frowned on. You know, I think that's the Protestant yeah. work ethic. It's like sweat to live in it. It's bullshit. So, how did your um, your like your latest album that you've released? Like, how did that come about? Was it just sort of like? Oh, this is a really, really just... convoluted story. This one because I had no intention of doing a solo project and I'd been doing collaborations for the past 10 years since Fila kind of hit a natural entropy in about 2004 I'd been working on kind of an handful of different collaborations hoping that one of them would kind of gel or stick or get noticed but there wasn't anything that was really kind of getting any traction and so um round about this time last year 
the publishers had asked me if I had any scraps lying around in hard drives for uh, library music, which is the stuff that you just sign away, basically, and anybody can use it as background yeah, yeah. music. Yeah. So I found about 30 tunes that spanned over, yeah, I think it's about, well, from when Feeler stopped working, about 2004, there was about 30 things in my drives that I thought, well, they're all right, I'll send them off to John. And um, in that process, I was like, well, actually, they're, they're maybe better than, I'd forgotten about most of them. And they were in various stages of completion. A couple of things were finished, but most of them maybe needed kind of one or two days' work on them. Uh, I thought, well, they're actually better than... They're maybe too good to send for library. So I said to John, look, make a list of the things. Make your top ten out of them 30 tunes, and I'll make my top ten, and let's tally up. And there was only one song on both lists, and he just wanted the shit. I was like, oh, that's, that's just ramble. That. It's like, well, you know, that's proper castaway gear. And the 12 that I'd picked, I was like, right, I'll finish them off. So I'd, over about, I think it was in October, early October, I spent about two or three weeks getting them all up to speed, all up to kind of uh, standard, uh, and, and put them together as an album's worth of stuff. And I intended to put that on the, on the label that I co-owned um, called Steel Tiger. And for a lot of different political reasons, that I thought that's not the path to go down. There, there didn't seem to be enough energy behind it. I'd been getting more and more frustrated with, um, you know, the the setup, uh, and so I thought, right, I'll, I'll, I've had enough of this. I'll I'll take this solo album around um, other labels, labels that I thought would be sympathetic, labels that knew the backstory with Park Recordings and Feel of Brazil and what have you. And there's about a dozen labels that I touted it to, and and I didn't I didn't even get a reply. I didn't even get a, a verbal reply, and 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 so that took me to about that was about January time. And I thought maybe I should just sack music, you know. It just it, it's just it's just a hobby, um, and and I I had a couple of months of kind of you know uh, self loathing I suppose, or just kind of feeling sorry for myself. And then I just when I when I kind of finally bottomed out and came out of that, I thought, nah, fuck it, I'll put it out myself. I'll put it out myself. The last thing I wanted to do was start my own label, and I certainly didn't have any intention of doing a solo album. Um, but there you go, you know, kind of serendipity forced me, forced me hand. And so by the time I got to March, I thought I'll just put it out digitally on Bandcamp. And there was there was there was lovely feedback for it. I thought, well, I'll do 100 CDs, and then I did 200 CDs, and I thought, well, that's it. I'll cut that off at limited edition. And then you know, the people that were like, you know, you're going to press it up on vinyl. I was like, well, I ain't doing yeah. anything on vinyl for like 10 years. You know, it's, yeah, it's, been... it's all coming back round again now. Well, it's yeah. enough enough to kind of. I think the old model's dead. You know, at the time when we were selling like 30, 40,000 CDs, that's long gone. You know, everybody just downloads the Philip Brazilian yeah, yeah. back catalogue as one four yeah. gigabyte torrent now, you know. So in terms of back catalogue or even sales kind of matching that, forget it. But if you're going to do like 500 units, that the old model's dead because the, the money just goes falls through the cracks, you know, between kind of label yeah. managers and PR companies and distributors and shops it's by the time it's got back to you it's not worth doing it whereas doing it as a one-man cottage in industry yeah, yeah. i mean i've made more out of this album than i have out of the previous five one releases man shed is the case maybe the one man shed yeah. <laughs> so yeah. i mean i'm kind of evangelical about it now you know i was i was yeah. reticent before i did it i mean I, you know the idea of going to the post office hundreds of times i won't really relish in but it, the direct connection with listeners has been astonishing it's been mm. fuel actually you know because it's propelled me forward because it's it's feedback that you never get when you're selling through shops or distributors. You get, you and you've got no idea what your listeners think. As well yeah, people as well, are sending yeah. you lovely emails back going like, you know, I've followed your stuff for X amount and, you yeah. know, I love your work and blah, blah, blah. And you're going, oh, And wow, in that sense, thanks. it has made it a little bit easier to, like, engage with people and talk Massively. to and stuff. Massively, yeah. you know. And, and so it, this is me now, you know. I, I can't imagine me going, well, I won't go back to the old way. Although... You know, the collaborations that I, I had in, in my drives, I thought, well, I don't want to put them out. I don't want the responsibility of putting stuff out for third parties anymore. Mm -hmm. So I've actually found a couple of them out. To, to they've been picked, One's been picked up by um, International Field Records and then uh, another collaboration. There's the one that I did with a girl called Trudy Dawn Smith is coming out on International Field. And then there's a collaboration with Isabel Helen is coming out on uh, BBE Records. So it... In some ways, the old model still works for me collaborations, but in terms of the stuff that I do solo, 
you know, it's just like, yeah, me, myself and I. Yeah. And I like that. I mean, pork recording started as that, really. It was like a little cottage industry thing. And I, and I think, well, I, I like the idea of going back to it, putting little handwritten notes in every yeah, release. And, yeah. You know, and, and giving it a bit more of a human feel. It's a boutique, bespoke thing. It's kind of handmade or, you know, it's not mass produced or yeah. manufactured, you know what I mean? And, and, and I think that's maybe, you know, makes more sense in that kind of digital age that we're going to. I mean, anybody can make a tune and email it into somebody's inbox. And, and, and it's almost kind of... I think people devalued pre- music, you yeah. know, in some ways that because it's like you know you wanted it to become a meritocracy, but in actual fact, it's like it's just white noise. It's just too-